call the room. I think it's important for the children to know about uh, World War II so that they grow up with the idea that it's not a, such a glorified uh, excursion, shall we say, to fight. Well, I kind of feel sorry for them that they had to go through the mess. I think that they were pretty brave to go and risk their lives in the Army. I have got a grandson every Remembrance Day he calls from Fort Cole Cleveland to thank me for their freedom. I think they should make Love Boat the movie. Okay, but listen, listen, I have it all planned out. Okay, Robert Duvall as Captain Steubing, and Denzel Washington as Isaac, Cameron Diaz as Julie, and I play Vicky Stolen. Behind the Badge. Ontario's finest take our cameras behind the scenes of law enforcement, criminal investigation, and special police units at work. Find out what it takes to serve and protect. Local. Live. Interactive. This is Rogers Television. New Market. Hi, I'm John Dowson, and you're watching Profiles. Have you ever had the urge to sit down and write your memoir so your family could learn more about who you were and what you did, and the things you thought about when you were young? Uh, my father did, and when we were younger, the last thing we wanted to know was what the old man did when he was young, but, uh, well, how he met our mother, what it was like raising a family, what they thought about when they are younger. But now that we're growing, uh, we want to know about these things, and if uh, he hadn't have put them all down on paper, it would have all died with them, and then it would have been too late. Well, today on our uh, show, we're going to meet a fellow who not only is an author of science fiction books, but uh, author of a book called How to Write Your Memoirs, and his name is Bert Ellis. Welcome to uh, Profiles, Bert. Thank you, John. Uh, I met you, um, I think it was last year, at uh, a, 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 a senior show, was it? Uh, right here in Newmarket. In Newmarket, mm -hmm. one of the uh, those uh, senior programs that they had, the... Uh, trade show, and mm -hmm. you had a booth there, and you were talking about uh, this book here, writing your memoirs, or memories. That's it. I was here with Mature Lifestyles, the publisher of the book, and publisher of the uh, local newspaper for seniors that passed around, and I came up to uh, sign any of the books that they sold. Oh, was that so, what it was? This yeah. is the actual book here. I hope I didn't get a, a picture of it. Oh, this is, or actually, uh, it's not a book, it's more of a workbook. It's not something you read. Well, is, uh, I like to think that people will read it and keep going back to it because uh, it's the essence of literally five years' work in compiling so, it. it. As you said, if you if you don't write this, uh, someone doesn't write it down. It's all going to die with them, isn't mm -hmm. it? And, and the people who will not know who uh, you were. And it seems to be more and more uh, interested in 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 history now. For some reason or other, people are wanting to know about their families, roots, that kind of thing. And uh, how did you get started on all this idea here? Well, I, am, I have been writing since uh, 1985, seriously. I had always wanted to write, but as I said earlier, writing is one step from being on welfare. <laughs> so yeah. I um, followed my second love, which was airplanes, by working for de Havilland Aircraft. But in 83, I think it was, I attended a science fiction writers conference in Toronto that was uh, one of the sponsored writers was Judith Merrill, uh, late Judith Merrill, who is uh, one of Canada's premier science fiction writers. And she said, if you really want to write, go out and create a writer's workshop or join one. So I did. What's a writer's workshop? What's that? Writer's workshop is an exercise in, in self-flogging uh, because you give your copy of your story to the other members of the workshop 
and they take it away and then they come back and tell you it's the most ridiculous piece of writing they've ever read <laughs> and just tear it to shreds and Pam, tell you there we go. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and these the other two people who are on are who are in this are they writers as well? Yes, uh, we started out with half a dozen, but you know, writers. It's yeah, it's a tough tough chore to follow a writing career. You have to be prepared to accept a tremendous number of rejections, which we all did, and people gradually got tired of, of not being accepted, and they dropped out. But the three of us that have stayed on, one is the uh, um, physics teacher, high school physics teacher, Eric Brown, who um, is responsible for the grade 10 physics uh, book in Ontario classrooms, or parts of it. And the other gentleman is um, in Seneca. He's a doctor of uh, electronics. So we have high and power. He, and these are people who wanted to write something. These gentlemen both want to write, as I do, and uh, we write together and share our notes back and forth. And it's great having people with such um, um, knowledge, if you like, as part of the team, because any of the way out stuff I write in science fiction that they say is just totally impossible, then they help keep me on the right path. So what kind of science fiction things do you, uh, have you written? I've written a series of uh, my favorite series uh, on what I call WTS, World Teleportation Systems, based right here in Toronto. I've called the Union Station the, the Toronto Hub, and all of the human adventures, if you like, uh, occur with a particular gentleman um, right there in, in the station in the center. Oh, and is it, is it some, something like, you know, uh, 2005 or uh, the year 3000? I haven't kind of? named the date because uh, although I read in a science journal that teleportation has been successfully demonstrated, which really amazed me. Down teleportation, is this where people Move. You've seen it in Star Trek, where yeah. they step in and they're dissolved and then they never, they re arrive at the destination. Um, I can't honestly ever see that happening, but who knows? How do you get all the molecules back together again? <laughs> you know? in, the right <laughs> in the right order, yeah. yeah. But um, in, in this series of stories, I've kind of developed the human aspect, uh, the, the science, the teleportation is simply the, the medium to give it interest. For instance, one of the stories is about, and the one that I uh, was applauded for, the readers voted it the best science fiction story of uh, 1998 or 99, um, was about a gentleman from the Atlanta um, Center for Disease Control arriving in Toronto using the teleport, and unfortunately he picked up the hepatitis uh, type disease and um, he spread it right through the system. The system became infected. Oh, during the, s the, the transportation, you mean? Mm -hmm. And so all the people who transported subsequently became infected, and the disease was rapidly spreading around the world, and uh, all the gyrations and adventures that people went through to identify and cancel all this. Uh, so they've had any of these spread. published? Uh, oh, yes, they've, yeah. they've all been published. So. It said you've had some short stories published in various magazines, uh, the Sunday Star has a, a short story contest, I know. Yes, uh, I, that, my first uh, success was with the Sunday Star, Toronto Star. And um, this came about from a conversation similar to ours. I um, was talking with Eric and said, if somebody were to write us a letter from, we'll say, 200 years' time, I wonder what they'd write about. And uh, we, we both put a, a story together based on that. And mine was based on the fact that everything has continued to go downhill. And here is a family uh, in Ontario who are living in a dome because the pollution is so severe. The highways are being closed down one by one because they've deteriorated. And people are now shrinking into dome cities. And the punchline of the story is, you know, if people had put people and life ahead of wealth, generating wealth, then maybe the world would never have come to this terrible state. And um, the final hook was, um, I stole a kind of a viewpoint from Milton's Paradise Lost. I said they stood and looked out over the city, and all behind them was blackness, which 
as you may know if you know Milton, is uh -huh. the way they viewed Paradise Lost. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I haven't read that, but I, I, I'm familiar with it. Mm -hmm. At the, uh, because it's funny you mentioned that, because I was listening to the radio the other day, and there was some school, uh, 1972, and it was a, a public school, and they put a time capsule together, the children of the day, and to what it will be like in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And these were grade five, six, uh, up to grade eight students. And they opened up the capsule, this year, and the, the, a lot of the, the people who are the children who are there now, of course, now in their 30s and, and mm -hmm. early 40s, um, and uh, one of them uh, was reading it, saying, "Well, you're probably uh, wondering, well, what, what this is, how I wrote this. Well, we wrote it on a pen and pencil because probably by the year 2000, we won't be using pens and pencils, <laughs> well, although we still do. But um, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's amazing." what we think of it happened. In 1939, the World's Fair, we thought everybody was going to be flying around in the year 2000, and uh, there would be no roads, be all flying around in, in um, like the Jetsons, you know, in a little uh, helicopter type of thing. Yeah, I'm one of the people who are very disappointed that uh, science fiction predictions haven't come about to that degree, because I was convinced when I was a young man that the automobile would be obsolete and we would be flying around in uh, flying cars at this point in time. It hasn't but happened yet. No, no the, the challenge is just too, too big. And, this, and then you've got it. This is, this is science, and you've also published, I think you said, uh, four novels. I, I guess it's true then, is everybody has a hidden novel in them and they just have to get out? <laughs> well, even if the novel is only your own life story, um, I guess when people get to be in their 50s, when the children are growing up and leaving home and their parents are dying, people suddenly recognize the values of life and it's at that point that they start thinking about, you know, what have I done with my life? Where am I going? And what did my parents do? And they start to realize that they really don't know that much about their folks. Because years ago people used to keep, I'm talking about years ago back in the 19th century, people used to keep uh, diaries. Yes, they did. And, uh, and then when they died, people found them. Some of them they didn't want them to find, but I mean, the peop a lot of people, that was a habit, people keeping diaries. And I, a friend of mine, his father was in the First World War, a fellow I met, and uh, apparently they gave the soldiers a diary. Everybody got this, like uh, you know, when they got, mm -hmm. when they were mustered in, they all got a diary. And he was, very few of them kept, kept it up, but he faithfully kept it up. And today his son has this diary. And my father, when he went up in northern Ontario, did the same thing. He, he kept it as a diary, and he took the diary later on and, be, and, and made a story out of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, how did this all come about, this century of, of uh, memories? memories? Yeah, how did this... Uh, well, the, the, this book essentially started as the handouts for the classes I was giving on. Uh, I shouldn't really call them classes because I didn't stand up and preach to people. They were workshops. The right. They, they were, were more of a workshop. And I started them with a selfish view of wanting to hear different voices from different people uh, hear the way, especially the Americans, you know, the, the, the way they speak and view life. And this was done in the United States when you were, when you were down on, uh, down on your Florida. holiday mm -hmm. in Florida. And uh, so each week I put together a, a kind of general hints and tips on how to go okay, about well, can writing. You, can you hold that thought? We'll come back and we'll talk about that. Don't go away. We're talking with Bert uh, Ellis and uh, how to write your memories or memoirs. Did you know the English immigrant G.S. Porter began publishing the New Era newspaper in 1852? Now you know it! Right, welcome back. And uh, when we went away, Bert, we were talking about, so you're, here you are in Florida now, you're retired, as I, I'm mm -hmm. assuming at this point. And, and you wanted to get a group of, what, retired people? Yeah, these were all retired people. I wanted to get some, in, I wanted to keep being involved in writing. I was with a workshop down there, a fiction writing workshop, but I wanted a, another group that would talk about their own lives, you know, because there's lots of interesting things that people have done there that can be exploited. I'll give you an example of one story. Um, one person I met, this man, he was kind of a dour person, sad. You could see there was a sadness in his life that uh, was hanging around. And I said, 
to him one day. I said, you know, what, what's bothering you? He said, I've carried the guilt with me since World War II. I was a gunner in, uh, we, we called them in Britain, the Baltimore bomber. I'm not sure what the designation the Americans gave to them. But they were flying over Italy in 1944, and uh, they were being followed by what they thought was a German aircraft and the captain signaled IFF, identify friend or foe signal, and the airplane didn't respond. And he said to the captain, now, well, I have him right in my sights, what do you want me to do? He said, well, shoot him. So he did. He said, I shot the aircraft down. He said, now, on the movies, they always show the people cheering when they knock an enemy aircraft down, but that isn't a fact in true life. We, you know, they're fellow aviators we just killed. He got back to the base and he was told that the only other aircraft flying in that sector was an RAF Allied airplane called a Blenheim. He said, I was responsible for the death of these Allied airmen and I've always felt terribly guilty about it. Well, I did some research and I said, I told him a couple of weeks later, I think your intelligence people were mistaken because there were no Blenheims flying in Italy in 1944. The Blenheim was virtually obsolete at the start of the war. They certainly weren't flying then, and sure enough, he made some inquiries, and uh, he came by later and thanked me. He said, why didn't I think of checking out that story myself? And this was part of his memories? This was part of his memories, yeah. So you, you started out as a workshop, and, it, and uh, there, there are ten chapters I noticed here. One says, the, the first one says, the greatest gift headlines of the first 10 years, fashions, and so on. So how, how would someone go about doing this? And we're not going to give the workshop on, on <laughs> TV, but... Uh. Well, essentially, we found that to get people started on their writing, because as I mentioned earlier, most people really don't like to write. You know, it's quite a chore for them. And then if they do write, they're worried about the grammar and the spelling and stuff like that. And I tell people, don't worry about that. You know, if you have a younger person in the family who can use a computer, a word processor, they'll correct the spelling for you. And don't worry about being grammatically correct. We want to hear you, your voice, the way you, you talk and speak. And uh, the essence of the notes were a series of questions. If people do no more than answer the questions in, in this book or in each worksheet, then they've written about that period of their life. And we start with childhood, and I ask them, what do you know about your parents, your grandparents? Do you remember any family history, any family stories from that period? Did they emigrate to America, Where did, or Canada? Where did they uh, live, and what did they do? And uh, get people writing all these facts. I ask them to telephone or write to all the living relatives that they have, and ask them, what do they know about their early family times? And do they have photographs? Because today, with right. the computer technology, you can scan photographs in and make a wonderful book, Family History. And, and that's where it starts. Now, you have headlines of the first 10 years. Uh, and is that part of what you, you, you would? No, that, this all came about after um, Mature Lifestyles, the publisher, uh, oh, I see. put the series in the paper, and it had been very well received. They suggested that we put a book together, but of course the ten handout sheets wouldn't be sufficient material to make a book, and there really wasn't enough uh, stuff there because in the in the classes in the seminars we had lots of chit chat back and forth, which would help people to get their memory into gear and start remembering things. So what did they do? They go and handwrite it longhand, typing, or on a computer well, or something? Most of it was longhand, yeah. And then they come back the next week? Mm -hmm. And then what do you do? Do you review these things? No, or? no. Uh, some of them we do. The first part of our session, we would talk about this week, we're going to talk about your teenage years and uh, all the things that went through, what do you remember about them, and people get so it would be like a, a social history as well. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, in fact, the, it's incredible, you know, the uh, one gentleman was saying how much things have changed in the social sense more than anything. He told me quite a cute story about being on the subway, and this lady of operatic proportions came into the train, and he stood up to offer her the seat. And she pushed him back down and said, no, you know, we're equal sort of thing. You keep your seat. You don't want to stand up for me. 
This went on a couple of times. Finally, said lady, said, I'm already two stops past my station. Surely you can let me go now. <laughs> <laughs> but there has been a tremendous change in social attitudes and social mores, and you recognize them. Uh, another tr true story one of my writers told me, he was a school teacher, and in fact he was in tears when he read the story to us. He said a young girl came into school this morning and uh, she looked so downcast, and he wondered if she'd been bullied or if she'd got some bad marks or something, and he said to her, what, what's the matter, you know? And she, she said she looked at him with such a sad face and said, my parents told me this morning at breakfast that they're getting divorced. And he said, that poor little kid, he said, I just had to hug her and comfort her. This was part of his memories. Yeah, and he said, and today you can't do that. He said, could you imagine a young school teacher, a young man getting hold of a young girl and hugging her in a corridor? The society's got totally different viewpoint on these actions today. And we, we just can't do things like that. And, and so when, when the people do this, uh, is it, is, is, you, would you start like when I was born or before I was born, like their parents no, or grandparents? I, I, to get people started, to prime the pump in essence, I say, go away and write about the most exciting event in your life, whether it was being married or winning the lottery or buying a new car or whatever. Something you really enjoyed, that you take great pleasure in something maybe you're proud of, the part of a, being part of a winning team. And the people, everyone has something that they're proud of. And they'd come back with their stories and uh, they were really stimulated with that. And do you have them read it off to them, do they, <coughs> if, if they want to? They oh, yes, I, I, I did. We have one Dutch lady, a former Dutch, she's Canadian now, um, read a story about World War II. She was in occupied Holland. And uh, we all expected a story about the Nazis and the Germans and that type of thing. Nothing to it. She was writing about harvest time and how the men had a long pole with leather thongs with a short piece of wood and were flailing the corn. And then the women had it on a sheet and were throwing it up in the air and the chaff was blowing away. And I said to her, my God, I said, do you realize that that's how corn was harvested in biblical times? I said, you've seen a piece of history that existed for two, three thousand years that's now a thing of the past. Children would never know that corn was harvested that way during your lifetime. I said, do they still do that? Oh, no, she said, they have machinery to do all of that now. <laughs> and, and this is, was part of her, her, her memoir? This was part of her memoirs that she was writing. Now, what happens then when they can get the whole thing completed? Right up well, to, to present, is that the idea, to go through that? And then they start writing a diary. Okay, so but now what happens to this? Is this given to the children, or to their children, or is this... Uh, I've had uh, at least half a dozen people finish their memoirs and come to tell me with great pride and delight that they'd finished them, they had them printed and bound, uh, had photographs scanned in, all the family photographs, diplomas and citations and the whole family history and gave a copy to each of their children and they said their children were just absolutely delighted. Really? And that's where I got the title from, The Greatest Gift. Because it, it really is, it's not the title of the book, no. one, one of the titles that I use. Because really you can't give anything more personal, you're giving your life history, your story to, to, to your, your family to pass down. And it's yeah. not there. Oh, I guess it is therapy in a way too, isn't it? Like you say, the fellow well, with the guilt, <laughs> right? Yeah. Here, here's the fellow that, and and uh, he had that guilt all those years, and it, mm -hmm. so it is a bit of therapy at the same time to get some of these things up. Yeah. Do, they, do they write the? Is, is it like everybody else? You go through some experience. You always write the funny things that you never think about the, the, the dark side. Well, I I deal with that in particular, dealing with the dark side of life. I ask people not to complain just to state the facts, but don't hide them, you know. If, if you were involved in bad times, then let the family know about them. And, uh, like if you had a financial disaster at some time and came out of it, they, you, you should write this down, let them oh, know. This is the history, right? Sure, it's part of the family history, and they'll admire you for it, you know. The black sheep of uh, three generations ago is today's hero because it's so romantic to you. And, and warts <laughs> and all, as they, say, as they right. say. So, 
And now you say that the paper, I see there's an article here, because we're running out of time, about Punta Gorda Herald, which is in... Uh, Southwest Florida, Florida. regional newspaper. And uh, they wrote an article about a local writer teaches how to record uh, your memoirs. I don't know if they can get a, a, a picture of that on there, so it doesn't. But that was written, uh, that article was in the paper when? 1998. So t just two they, years ago. They've heard about the, uh, the memoir writing groups because people really talked up. They had such a great time attending the groups and still do that they were bragging about them. And this paper came along and interviewed me and asked them to read the handouts and then they asked if they could publish them and now these were just the raw handout notes just the notes from your from seminars the, from the seminars but they got such a tremendous response from the public they had letters from as far away as new zealand believe it or not people had visited florida on vacation read a couple of issues of the paper and gone home and said hey i'd like to have the rest of these and uh, wrote in so the paper in the final issue uh, said they would run a copy off for anyone who came to the offices and that was this oh, document here. Oh, this is the copy here that they, they gave away to the, uh, the people who came in. And they had the uh, one of the secretaries running a photocopy machine for two days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're just going to take a short paper and we'll be right back with Bert Alice. Don't go away. Call us and tell us what you think of the show. Phone 836-7197. You can write to us at 395A Mulock Drive, Newmarket, Ontario, L3Y8P3. And when you're surfing the web, check out rogerstelevision.com. Welcome back, and uh, we're here with Bert uh, Ellis, uh, who is the, uh, I guess, the facilitator of a book, a course that he's called Century of Writing Memories, uh, where you can sit down and write your memories to your family. And as it says in this article here, this, the story of your life is the greatest gift for your loved ones. That, that really is something, isn't it? Now, are you going to be doing this in Canada? Will, will people local who are watching this might be able to get an idea? Or do you s just buy the book? Is that the so idea? You can buy the book through the Mature Lifestyles. It's advertised in there. And um, So they can call, what number could they call if they wanted to buy one of these? Because, you know... I, I think the number's in, right in the back there. Is, uh, oh, I see. Mature Lifestyles is a magazine. Is, isn't it? is the local uh, free news, newspaper. It's published it's in the, in yeah, market. right here. In, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they could get phone uh, Mature Lifestyles and get uh, one of these books? And they yes. I guess they have to buy it, right? Do you know oh, how yeah. much it costs? It's $25 plus uh, taxes and, uh, and shipping costs. Do you think you might sometime uh, do uh, workshops here? I should really. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thanks for coming by, Bert. It's I appreciate a real pleasure, John. I totally enjoyed it. Well, Thank that's you. our show for this week. I'm John Dowson. Until next time, bye for now.